Okay, <clears throat> and I'm going to share my screen. We're just going to have slides, so give me a second. Oops, actually, stop share for a second. Okay, can you see my slides in full screen mode, Mandy? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, my name is Meg Reed. I'm the Coastal Shores Specialist for the Oregon Department of Land Conservation and Development and uh, serve as a subject matter expert on statewide planning goal 18. Um, welcome to our first rulemaking advisory committee meeting for the ocean fronting public road protection. I apologize that the rulemaking title is a bit of a mouthful, but we are trying to be specific about what we are trying to do here in this rulemaking process. So today's meeting is going to be a little bit heavy on me talking with you and our next meeting will be much more a work focused meeting so I apologize that this meeting will be a lot of um, presentation mode and um, listening uh, to sort of the the background information, but hopefully um, it's still helpful to get everyone on the same page as we move into our rulemaking efforts. And, uh, you know, this might be review for some of you in particular, but for some it will be new information. So we want to really make sure that everyone is starting from the same page. So we really want to start with the background information and really talk about how we got to this point today of initiating rulemaking for ocean fronting roads. So um, this is just a little bit of our agenda for the day. We'll start with our staff introductions and a review of public meeting law. And then we'll move into RAC member introductions. And uh, sorry, I know sometimes there'll be a lot of acronyms around. So RAC is Rulemaking Advisory Committee. Um, and then we'll go into going over a lot of the information that was in the packet that was sent to you about a week ago, the operating principles and guidelines. And, um, and then we'll go into an overview of the Department of Land Conservation Development's role and the statewide land use planning program to kind of give a 10,000 foot view of everything. Um, and then get into goal 18 and goal two and the history of how we got to this rulemaking, the charge to the RAC members from our commission. And then we'll go into the timeline for this effort, our next steps and meeting scheduling. And at any time, please feel free to interrupt me and ask questions. You can either write them in the chat or you can come off mute and, and just talk because we're a fairly small group, which is great. I would just say that this is, um, I'm inviting members of the RAC to, to come off mute and, and to talk with us. If you are a member of the public and you are just listening, please um, make sure to stay on mute. There will be no opportunity for verbal public comment during this meeting, but there will be at future meetings and written comment, public comment is will be accepted anytime and can be emailed directly to me. And I will share my address email address later on in the meeting. Um, so before I start introductions, does anyone have any questions or comments at the moment? I won't really be able to see the chat very well. So Mandy, if, if anything comes up, please let me know and interrupt me. Um, Will do. But thank you. Um, <clears throat> any other thoughts, questions before we start? And you can um, feel free to be on camera or off camera. I know everyone has different levels of internet capability. So um, you can, you're welcome to do whatever you're comfortable with. I would ask when we do introductions, if you do have the ability to share your camera, please do so just so we can get to see each other a little bit. But um, if you can't or you don't want to, that's okay. Um, it's whatever you feel comfortable doing. I will try to stay on camera, but if my internet starts being um, a little bit sketchy, I might turn off my camera as well. So now I'm going to pass it over to Casaria uh, to introduce herself and then um, Mandy. Hi, good afternoon. Casaria Taylor. I'm the Rules Coordinator for the Department of Land Conservation and Development. Thank you. And then Mandy. Uh, 
Hi, my name is Mandy McNabb and I am the Oregon um, Coastal Management Program Administrative Support and I'll be assisting Meg with the support for this rulemaking. Thank you, Mandy. So yeah, Casaria and Mandy will be the main other points of contact be beside myself for this rulemaking. Um, we also have two of our uh, regional representatives who will be probably listening in to our um, meetings, and that's Hue Radomski, who's the South Coast Regional Representative, and also um, Lisa Phipps, who's our North Coast Regional Representative. And I think Patty Snow might be on the line too. So Patty, if you wanna introduce yourself real quick too. <clears throat> Thanks, Meg. Hi, this is Patty Snow. I'm the Oregon Coastal Program Manager with the LCD and just like to welcome everybody to this and thank you so much for your time with helping us with this important issue. Thanks, Meg. Yeah, thank you. Did I miss anyone else from DLCD staff? Okay. Great. And, and also, I just wanted to mention that um, I have sort of a dual role with this rulemaking. I will be both a subject matter expert as well as the facilitator. Um, so I'll try to be keeping us on track and going through the process of the meetings. Um, but I will ask you all as well to help to keep things on time and, and balanced um, with that so, um, so that we don't get too into the weeds on any one thing and, and keep our goals in mind. Um, and then as role of the as the role of the facilitator, I um, am not only helping to ensure a balanced process, but also want to identify and communicate common themes, areas of disagreement and decision points, and then report that information back to our department and the Land Conservation Development Commission. So um, before we get into more of the, the gist of the agenda, I would like to do a land acknowledgement and have asked Mandy to read it for us. Hi everybody. I'd like to acknowledge the many tribes and bands who call Oregon their ancestral territory and honor the ongoing relationship between the land, plants, animals, and people indigenous to this place we now call Oregon. We recognize the continued sovereignty of the nine federally recognized tribes who have ties to this place and thank them for continuing to teach us how we might be able to be here together. Great, thank you so much, Mandy. All right, so um, I'll just dive into a few of sort of housekeeping things that wanted to share. They were also in the meeting packet, so hopefully you all have read through them already, but just wanted to review some of the most important details. Um, this rulemaking advisory committee is subject to public meetings law, and we will be treating them as such. Um, basically, this is just that, to make sure that all governing body meetings covered by the law are open to the public. It guarantees the public to the right to attend meetings, but dot, does not include the right to participate. Um, and so uh, just a couple of things to note with that. Um, for each of you who is a member of the committee, please um, email department staff only and do not email each other individually because um, that can trigger some other pieces. So just um, for consistency's sake, please, um, if you have correspondence that you would like to share with other committee members, make sure to send them to me, Mandy or Casaria first, and then we will then further share that out to the rest of the group. Um, we are required, as I said, to provide public notice about every meeting. So we do that through our email system called Gov Delivery. And that is um, uh, open to anyone who, who wants to sign up for those notifications. Those are the ability to sign up for that is on our web page that is dedicated to this rulemaking space. So um, they, anyone can sign up to subscribe to that. Um, meetings are open to all to view and the Zoom links are posted on our web page. And so um, you know anyone is able to view those meetings. Um, like I said in the beginning, written comments are accepted at any time to my email address, which is there on the screen and uh, oral public comment opportunities will be limited during this um, rulemaking endeavor, but there will be some opportunities. We also need to provide written meeting summaries, which will be provided within two weeks of each of the meetings. 
Um, and as uh, we saw in the beginning, the meetings will be recorded and that's to um, be able to share them back for, for others who have not been able to view them while they're happening and then also for meeting notes purposes so that we have a, a summary of what everyone has been able to say and participate in. Um, so that's kind of an overview of, of the public meetings law and how these will go. We anticipate there will be about three meetings total, this being the first one. Um, and uh, we'll talk more about the content of the other meetings a little bit later. So now I'd like you all to introduce yourselves so we can get to know each other a little bit better. Um, so I will um, go through my list and, and call on people if you can come off mute and say who you are, what organization or interest you represent, and what motivated you to serve on this rulemaking advisory committee. Um, so if I can start with Jack Stillwell, please. Can't hear you unless I'm the only one not hearing. It's not just you, Meg. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Hmm. So I, if, it looks like your microphone is moving on my list, but it, I, we can't hear you. So that's interesting. Um, maybe try um, turning off your microphone and turning it back on. But in the meantime, I'm going to pass it over to Charlie. Hey there, thanks Meg. Uh, Charlie Plyvin, Oregon Policy Manager for Surfrider Foundation. I'm here on the Central Coast in uh, the Newport area. Uh, and I believe you asked what inspired us to join this RAC. Um, I think the ongoing challenges with uh, climate change, sea level rise and uh, erosion on our coast is gonna force us to make some difficult decisions uh, with respect to infrastructure. Um, particularly some of the, the built systems like our roads. And uh, this is one of the reasons why I joined. Great, thank you, Charlie. Um, I would also mention, I, I didn't have this in my prompt that if you were part of the goalie team policy focus group um, to mention that too, and Charlie was a member of that group that, and I will explain what that all entailed a little bit later on. Um, let's go to um, uh, Elizabeth. You're frozen. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Great. Can you introduce yourself? My name is Elizabeth Van Lustenet. I am out at Cape Blanco, which is southern Oregon coast. Um, retired. And a family member said, you should be on this committee. So there I am. Great. Well, thank you so much. We'd really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, okay. How about Jeff? Hi, everyone. I'm Jeff Crook. I'm the I'm with the Oregon Department of Transportation. Um, I'm the policy lead with ODOT's Climate Office. And I was a member of the Goal 18 focus group uh, that was held a couple of years back. Um, so ODOT's responsible for operating and maintaining the state highway system, including Highway 101. So we have a real strong interest in, in the long-term protection of the highway, keeping it open and reliable to commerce and the traveling public. Um, there are many hazards and challenges that we deal with with US 101. Um, and there's, just, there's not gonna be any one solution that's gonna solve the erosion problems and the risks to the highway. Um, but the options provided through this rulemaking effort could be one of the tools in the, in the toolbox um, for how, how we do this. Um, thanks for having us as part of this group and for leading this effort. Great, thank you, Jeff. How about Melissa? Oh, I think you're still on mute. <laughs> 
Gosh, I got the camera off. You'd think we'd have the standby now. Um, <laughs> I'm Melissa Cribbins. I'm a Coos County Commissioner. And uh, being from Coos Bay and dealing with a lot of infrastructure, my role as a commissioner, very interested in this topic and um, what we can do for the future. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thanks so much. Um, how about Nan? Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So I'm Nan Devlin and I'm the executive director for Tillamook Coast Visitors Association, which represents Tillamook County and uh, stewardship and public safety um, as part of our um, initiatives for destination management. And um, that's what brought me uh, my interest to this group. Great, thank you. We're definitely glad to have you here. Um, okay, let's see. How about Laurel? Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes. I can't see myself because I'm on my phone. No. <laughs> I don't know what I look like. Um, Laurel Hillman, Oregon Parks and Recreation Department, Ocean Shore Specialist. Um, our agency manages the Ocean Shore State Recreation Area, including the Alteration Permit Program. And so I'm happy to be part of this group. I wasn't a member of the previous committee, but I did participate in all the meetings. Thanks. Yes, thank you, Laurel. Um, okay, so I think um, back to you, Jack. We'll see if your microphone's working. No, we can't hear you. Oh no. Um, it seems like you can hear us, which is good. Um, I'm really sorry that we can't hear you. Um, there may be some computer settings to change for the microphone that you're using. Um, but if you can chat in the chat box, maybe just write um, who you are and what motivated you to join. We can um, at least hear you that way. Yeah, and there's also, uh, Mandy has a good point, there's also an opportunity to call in um, if you want, which was on the original calendar invite. Um, and I think maybe Mandy, if you could put it in the chat too, just in case anyone needs it in the future. Um, okay. <clears throat> well, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Um, I know it's definitely um, a time time consuming process to be involved in these. So we really appreciate you when you bring your different lived pers experiences and perspectives to this rulemaking. Um, and so hopefully after today, you'll have a little bit better understanding of what exactly we're trying to accomplish. Um, so the role of the rule advisory, rulemaking advisory committee is to be advisory to staff, um, DLCD staff, and to provide recommendations for policies, language of the rule and direction. Um, you are considered volunteers by the state and as such must comply with open meetings law, public records and ethics laws. Um, you will be supported by me and the other DLCD staff. Um, it, consensus is not um, required, but is uh, desired. So that is sort of what we want, but isn't a requirement. And it's not a voting body. Um, we anticipate we'll be meeting a total of three times, wrapping up in March of 2022. Um, and hopefully there is some other information included in the rec packet that kind of talks a little bit more detailed about that, but wanted to at least provide this high level um, of a overview of the role of the RAC. Um, any questions or concerns from anyone at this point? Okay, gonna move on then. Um, the, this is a, a review of the operating principles and guidelines for how we will do this work. Um, so again, this is kind of just an overview of what, what was in more detail in the meeting packet to act in good faith stay on topic, help um, have a balanced speaking time so that everyone can participate and we can hear from everyone's perspective, um, address issues and questions, not people or organizations, listen with respect and speak one at a time, 
dis discuss topics together to the extent possible and not in isolation and communicate on behalf of your stakeholder group. So we expect that you will be sharing your interests from your experiences or organizations. And then if you are, are on behalf of an organization to bring that information back to them and then you know, likewise bring it back to the group. Um, and then to attend all meetings. I would mention, I forgot to mention this earlier that um, we have one other member, Cameron LaFollette, who is the executive director of the Oregon Coast Alliance. She was unable to be here today, unfortunately, last minute conflict, but she will be listening to the recording after the fact of, um, of this meeting, um, but she will be at other all the other meetings. So just wanted to mention that too. That, uh, so I think we should all together be um, a nine member group plus uh, DLCD staff. Okay, so that's kind of the high level overview. We will get to the rack charge later on in the meeting, um, but I wanted to start with a little bit more background and history first, so that hopefully the charge will make more, more sense in that broader overview. Um, so again, like I said, this is gonna be a review for some of you, but for others it will be new. And so we want everyone to start from the same page. So I'm gonna start with just a little bit brief overview of our department and land use planning in Oregon. Um, so many of you may be very familiar with this, but basically Oregon has a very unique and comprehensive statewide land use program that is um, the foundation of which is 19 planning goals, which are listed here on the screen on the left hand side. And they range from everything from citizen involvement to economic development, housing and transportation, natural resource management. And the last four are coastal resource specific. So those are ones highlighted in blue and they are estuarine resources, coastal shorelands, beaches and dunes, and ocean resources. And so every city and county in the state, including state agencies, have to comply with these statewide planning goals. And, uh, and those of us on the coast also have to comply with those last four goals. And um, goal is a bit of a misnomer. Uh, they are required through, uh, they are rules that have been codified in statute. So they are requirements. And the sort of the, the center of it all is our Land Conservation and Development Commission, which is a volunteer body, a seven member volunteer body that is appointed by the governor and confirmed by the Senate. And they represent the various interests um, and geographies of the state of Oregon. Then we have our 19 statewide planning goals, which are the foundation of the program. And our staff and our department um, sort of lead and administer the program, but really it is implemented through city and county comprehensive plans and through state agency programs and authorities. So like the removal fill permit, um, water quality permits through um, DSL and DEQ. Um, so all of those, those um, pieces all fit together in this overarching land use program. And then we also have the the Oregon Coastal Management Program, which is a federally approved coastal zone management program. Any coastal state and territory in the United States is able to have one of these, um, and all of them do except for Alaska. And it's a voluntary partnership between the federal government and the states to do coastal zone management through, uh, throughout these um, really dynamic and sensitive resources because the federal government does have an interest in what happens in these areas, but they don't do land use planning. So that's where the state partnership comes in. And we are able to get federal funding to do this work. And our program in Oregon is also unique like our land use plan, plan planning program. Um, so it makes sense that it's administered by DLCD um, and it includes the all of the entities that work or reside in the coastal zone, which is pictured on the map on the right. And so it's approximately the crest of the coast range out to three nautical miles or the extent of our territorial sea. So it's really a watershed based coastal zone. It's pretty large. It's larger than most other coastal states. And all of the cities and 
counties that are within that area must comply with our coastal management program and those four coastal goals, as well as the other statewide planning goals. And so you can see a list of all of our coastal counties and cities listed there. So it's a pretty big zone um, and it's a very networked program. And we're, we're very proud of that partnership because it's more of a bottom up based approach than a top down one. And we do lots of things in the coastal program, um, and some of those are listed here on the screen, do obviously land use planning, but also hazard planning, marine spatial planning, and then the implementation of those plans. And what we'll really be focused on in this planning effort is statewide planning goal 18, and really the hazard and land use side of things, um, because we are talking about the hazards of coastal erosion and the impacts that could be exacerbated over time with climate change. And this is just a map to kind of help to orient you geographically to those four coastal goals and because they really are resource and, and geographically specific. So goal 16 is the estuary environment. So it's at, around the mouths of rivers and bays up all the way through the tidal extent of those water bodies. Then goal 17 is shoreland areas. So it's all of the lands that abut water bodies. So that includes outer coast, the estuary and inner coast, as well as any coastal lakes. And then goal 18 is really what we're going to be focused on through this group is the beaches and dunes. So that's a very thin coastal strip that includes the beach and dune areas throughout Oregon. It's very long north to south, but not very wide east to west. And then goal 19 is the ocean resources. And so that's really concerned with those areas that are out in the ocean beyond the land. And that is governed by our territorial sea plan. So those are kind of, that's the, the geographic areas that we're, we're working under and that there's lots of different provisions that guide planning around those resources that are spelled out in those coastal goals. But like I said, we'll really be focused on the one within beaches and dunes. I do see that some of our other members have joined, so I might ask them, just pause for a minute and ask them to introduce themselves real quick. Um, it would be Chris and Cameron. Um, if you could both just come off mute for a second and say who you are, who you represent, and uh, what motivated you to be on the RAC. So Chris Lady, I'm the Director of Public Works for Tillamook County. Uh, we have approximately two and a half miles of uh, county roads that uh, run parallel and directly adjacent to uh, beaches. So as we continue down this process, I didn't want us to be completely ODOT centric with Highway 101, is to also see the bigger picture. Great, thank you, Chris. Appreciate that. And Cameron? Um, I'm Cameron LaFollette. I'm the Executive Director of Oregon Coast Alliance, a coastal conservation organization focusing on land use advocacy. <clears throat> and we have dealt with um, quite a few different controversies relating to uh, goal 18, goal 18 exceptions, riprap, other shoreline armoring, um, burritos, uh, and whether or not they work in different uh, places, and recognize that the probably the largest single um, issue related to goal 18 and goal 18 exceptions <clears throat> is what is required for Highway 101 and its safety. So uh, wanted to be on this uh, rules committee in order to participate in the rulemaking of making, uh, making sure that whatever is done for Highway 101 is as uh, matches as closely as possible what the actual needs are. Uh, that's a really important issue in um, dealing with uh, whatever comes to the future, uh, to the forefront in the future concerning goal 18, especially when we have um, increasing wave heights and sea level rise and other important coastal problems. Great, thank you. Thanks for being and here. I can't stay on for very long, only about 20 minutes. I'm sorry, I ended up with a double conflict today. I apologize. No worries, thank you. Great, well, thanks everyone. 
Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about um, goal 18 specifically. I think you know many of you are already very familiar with this goal, but just as a review, um, this statewide planning goal is really about protecting um, and the area of the beaches and dunes and also thinking about develop appropriate development and how to ensure that that development is not in the hazard, most hazardous areas. So it's really trying to balance the protection of the beaches with um, development in uh, appropriate places. So there are a few provisions, but there are three areas that come up most frequently for local governments. One is that there are areas that are prohibited from development. Um, commercial, industrial, and houses are prohibited from the most dynamic areas that are subject to ocean flooding. Then there are some requirements around dune grading. And generally that is for um, lowering dunes to improve views. Um, our commission, when um, the goals were first put into place, actually outright banned dune grading, but so many people were doing it illegally that we came together with a group of experts and scientists to try to figure out how we could do it in a way that really protect the buffering capabilities and protective qualities of, of beaches and dunes. And so there are quite a number of requirements around dune grading in the goal. Um, but that's not really, we're sort of talking about the opposite problem here, which is erosion. And so that's really covered under the beach for beachfront protective structure limitation. Beachfront protective structures being things like riprap and seawalls that are meant to protect private property from the effects of coastal erosion. And really there, um, <clears throat> uh, just wanted to say real quick, um, Jack is here, he's able to hear, but um, is not able to access his microphone. So I'm sorry about that, but hopefully we can utilize the chat function throughout the meeting. Um, so yeah, the beachfront protective structure limitation was added to the goal to really try to limit the amount of armoring along the Oregon coast because it has negative impacts. Um, and, uh, and so what happened is that they put in a grandfathering clause. Um, but before I get to that, just I like to show this picture and some of you have seen this already, um, but this, I think this really shows how goal 18 and the policy has played out along the landscape over time and why it is so important. Um, so uh, this is an aerial shot of Pacific City, and on the right-hand side, you can see houses that are built basically in the crest of the four dune, and you can see sand inundating those structures and even the houses right behind them. These houses were built before Goal 18 went into effect, and so um, they, they have a sort of a built and committed exception because they were already there. And so in, if they had been built after the fact, they wouldn't have been allowed to build there, but they already existed so they allowed to uh, they're allowed to continue to exist and they have constant problems with sand inundation flooding and erosion from the dynamic system of the beach and dune area immediately to the north or to the left on the screen is an area that was developed after the goal 18 policies went into effect and you can see that they're behind a dune that's stabilized with vegetation and so they don't have that constant stream of moving sand around and they have that natural buffer from the ocean and uh it's protecting from erosion and, and flooding. So um, you can really see how important this policy is across the landscape in trying to protect the resource as well as protect human development. Getting back to the beach run protective structure limitation, um, there is a clause within the goal that says only development that existed as of January 1st, 1977 is allowed to have beach run protection and development is defined as houses, commercial and industrial buildings and vacant but improved subdivision lots, improved being that they had access to roads and uh, utilities. So this was basically, like I said, it's a grandfathering clause to allow those development decisions that had already occurred prior to the, uh, the policy being in effect to continue to exist and to have the option to protect with a structural um, option like riprap or seawalls. But if you were developed after that fact, you would have to take erosion into account and incorporate non-structural options like setbacks um, or you know vegetation plantings or things like that. So, um, and this again was to really try to limit the amount of armoring because it can limit beach access from north to south. They fix the shoreline in place and they can trap sediment that would otherwise be part of the system and add to the landscape. Um, and it can really uh, alter 
the beach and dune littoral system. And if you've never heard the term littoral cell before, we might say that here and there. It's basically um, anything between two headlands or two jetties, areas where the sand mostly stays in that area and, it's, um, and it might accrete or erode depending on where you are in that system. Um, we developed an inventory of the eligibility of every oceanfront lot back in 2015. It's publicly available, anyone can access it. It's on our coastal atlas and the URL is listed there on the screen. Um, it does show uh, green for those that are eligible for protection or those built before 1977 red for not eligible for protection or those built after 1977. The viewer also includes a whole host of other hazard information and administrative boundaries. So it can be helpful to see that in con conjunction with other types of data sets. So just to give you a few stats of where the shoreline armoring is in Oregon and how effective or not this policy has been, um, about 22.7 miles of Oregon's coastline is currently armored, which is about 6% of the overall coastline. And that's fairly low if you compare it to other coastal states and their percent of armoring. The graphic on the uh, right hand side does show the center points of all of our existing beach run protective structures. And so you can see that they're really clustered around the northern counties of Tillamook, uh, Lincoln, and Clatsop. And that's where most of our armoring is, 92%. And that's not surprising. That's where most of our coastal population lives. So it's not necessarily that erosion is any worse in those areas. It's just that it's coming into human development and infrastructure more often in those areas because they're more highly developed. 84% uh, of the coast is not eligible for armoring under current policies. So that's a, a good amount of the coast. And But uh, these eligible and unarmored lots uh, still account for a lot of the shoreline, about 42 miles. So there's still a lot of potential armoring to occur over time. Um, and I would just say that um, there is um, a professor at Oregon State University who has done some research on the effects of goal 18's policies. And uh, he has found that if we removed the policy of goal 18, shoreline armoring would increase an additional 69% over the next 40 years. And if you added sea level rise into that, armoring would increase an additional 5.4%. So goal 18 really is working in that, in the sense that it is really limiting the amount of shoreline armoring that would otherwise occur on Oregon's coast if it weren't for this policy. But eligibility is really just the first step to getting a shoreline protective structure. Oregon State Parks um, is actually the permitting authority for these structures, and that's because they are the steward of the ocean shore. Um, they do permits for any ocean shore alteration and other activities, um, and those include beachfront protective structures, beach access ways, dune grading, pipelines and cable laying, and natural product removal. Um, so they have a permit system for that, and um, within the permit for those ocean shore alterations, there is a requirement for a local government sign-off. So that's where that eligibility component comes into play. Um, a local government official has to sign off on that permit and say whether or not that property is eligible under Goal 18's provisions, and uh, if it's in compliance with their other land use goals and their comprehensive plan. So that's sort of how this whole thing kind of plays out on the landscape is through a private property person or a public um, person putting together a, uh, an application and then getting that sign off from the local government and then going through Oregon Parks and Recreation Department. Uh, they have their own set of criteria and rules that then um, decide whether or not a permit is approved or denied. They have things um, that are included in their application requirements, including hazard avoidance. Um, you have to talk about uh, limitations of the area, and um, you might have to get a geologic report from a registered professional geologist. Um, and so there's a, a whole host of factors that I'm not going to get into, but all of that to say that the, the eligibility is sort of just one of many criteria and steps that someone has to go through to get a shoreline protective structure. And that those rules are under the purview of the Oregon Parks and Recreation Department, and they are not the, the rules that are being edited or um, or discussed in this rulemaking. We are only able to do rulemaking for whatever our department has um, authority over. 
Um, just a little bit more about the ocean shore jurisdiction, because um, not everyone knows that um, we do have a rolling easement in Oregon. So um, the ocean shore or the area that um, Oregon Parks and Recreation Department has authority over is the land lying between extreme low tide of the Pacific Ocean and the statutory vegetation line or the line of established upland vegetation, whichever is further landward. So that line can move over time um, as it erodes backwards. And and so you can see an example of this on the screen where the red line is a statutory line of vegetation. And then you can see the actual line of vegetation with those trees there on, on the screen. So the jurisdiction of state parks can move over time. So I'm gonna stop there for a second to see if anyone has any questions, um, how we're all feeling. Um, there's still more to come, but um, if we want, we can take a quick five minute break if people need to just step away from the computer for a second, um, but I will, I'll leave it to you. So let, let me know how everyone's feeling. If you have any questions or if you would like a break. And hopefully tell me that I'm not talking to myself. <laughs> Sorry, Meg, I'm going to have to leave here um, in a, a few minutes. So when you see me disappear, it's just because I have another obligation. I have to also, and I can't be two people on two meetings at the same time, unfortunately. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Thanks for the heads up. Um, okay. Charlie says, keep pressing on. Anyone else have an opinion? I agree with Charlie. Okay, and Laurel too. So I will keep going then. But if you have any a point, wanna stop me for any reason, please don't hesitate. Okay, so moving on, uh, sort of like, okay, we're, we had the big picture and we're starting to narrow in into how we're getting to this rulemaking. And I promise we will get there. Um, so in 2019, our department decided to uh, con convene a group that we called the Goal 18 pre-1977 development focus group um, to explore sort of practitioner issues that have come up over the years of this um, provision of Goal 18 and the definition of development and how that sort of played out on the ground. Um, one thing I should mention that is kind of uh, somewhat relevant is that the the definition for development in the goal wasn't always there. When the goal was first established in 1977, it just had um, uh, just the first sort of part of it. And then the definition of development was added in 1984 because there were a lot of areas of confusion around that in um, from practitioners. And that, that went against what our commission intended for the rule to be. So then that definition was added in 1984. Um, but there have been, um, um, some issues that have come up by practitioner, practitioners over time. And so we wanted to explore that. And we did that through four main concepts. And I'm not going to talk about all of them, but just one of them is relevant to this rulemaking because really this talking about that led to this rulemaking. Um, so that was all about this issue about public infrastructure and facilities, um, especially Highway 101, but as Chris brought up, it's other public infrastructure and facilities as well. Things that are vulnerable to coastal erosion, but are not included in that definition of development that was added in 1984. Um, I did include a copy of this final report um, in the rack packet. It's you know about 30 or so pages long. Um, we're not going to go through it by any means, but it's there as a resource in case it's helpful. Um, and I would mention that um, I think we talked about this a little already, but Charlie, Jeff, and Laurel were all part of that original um, focus group. And we did have a, a, quite a few outcomes from that. And some of them we have been working on over the past couple of years since that ended in 2019. Um, so we are making progress with some of those recommendations. And this is certainly one of them. Um, so like I alluded to, public infrastructure is not included currently in the, uh, the definition for development eligible for shoreline armoring. And so the group, the policy group really uh, had a discussion around that. Should public infrastructure be included? And 
what would that entail? What kinds of infrastructure, critical infrastructure, other types of infrastructure? How can we tell whether it was developed before or after 1977? Do we have the data for that? Um, ultimately, the group did decide that to recommend to move forward with the idea of including infrastructure um, to be considered um, able to get shorefront protection under certain circumstances. And we really uh, whittled it down to public roads along the oceanfront um, at this point in time. So that's what our policy team um, ultimately approved for rulemaking. And so that is what we are focused on uh, for this rulemaking is the public roads that were developed before 1977 to really keep with the intention of that original provision of the goal. Um, I borrowed this slide from ODOT um, and Jeff can jump in uh, if he has any updates to this um, because uh, ODOT is actually conducting um, a study right now, um, a risk and vulnerability assessment of Highway 101 to really drill down on where on the highway are the most vulnerable areas to coastal erosion and might benefit from structural shoreline protection. Um, so there was a, a study done a few years ago that kind of looked at this a little bit more broadly, and they identified about 19 highway miles, which is about 5% of Highway 101 as potentially um, needing short front protection. But it is likely that that is going to be a lesser number um, when all is said and done, when they get down to the, the specifics of it. Um, I don't know, Jeff, if you want to add anything else at this point. Yeah, I, I can kind of add that these this original work, I think this map and kind of the sites identified was back in 2002, so quite a long time ago. And it was really just a high level proximity analysis using GIS and aerial photos, like how close is the highway to the coastal bluffs, um, I, identifying those hotspots and providing fairly broad swaths of, of hotspot areas that often included upland areas, so upland landslides. Um, the, the research project we have ongoing now, which is the risk assessment you just mentioned, is being led by Oregon State University, and they've got some great people working on that. Um, that's really taking a more comprehensive look up and down the coast. So there are, they started with more than 27 sites, um, but they're really looking at kind of a science-based erosion rate for all of these locations, what's the exposure, um, and then there will be this priority ranking of those sites. And then from there, we'll get into the economic costs and um, the viable routing options at those locations, things like that. So um, you are correct, this, this number will be changing. Um, right now, based on our uh, priority risk list, there are about, uh, I think it's 14 miles currently that are in considered areas of concern. So okay. to be continued. Thanks for the option. Yeah, thank you. That's helpful. I, I wanted to share this with you all because um, you know, through this rulemaking and going through an exception process, you know, we're we're ultimately going to allow more armoring to occur on the coast through this. But we, I wanted to kind of give you a picture of how much more armoring are we talking about? And it's hard to say comprehensively at this point, but you know, we're we're maybe talking about 20 miles and probably less. And it's not that every one of those sites would need armoring right away or even armoring altogether. But those are sort of the preliminary assessments of where those those sites are. And, and again, it's not just Highway 101, but any public road that would be ocean fronting and at risk. Okay, so that's kind of how we got here. Um, so back in July of this year, our commission, our Land Conservation and Development Commission did um, decide to initiate rulemaking, which is what we're now in through this rulemaking group. Um, the, the rule when uh, put into the final language will become effective in August of 2022. And that's really just um, like I've communicated to you all before. There's no, the, those dates are not magic or special in any way. It's really just our agency 
has a has a pretty high volume of rulemaking efforts that we're doing, and Casteria is only one person, and she can't do it all at once. So, um, and neither can our commission. They're really big deals that um, take a lot of their time. So we're just kind of putting them in order, and um, and trying to get through as many as we can. Um, and so uh, there's a couple of rulemakings that are happening right now that are that are taking up our commission's time, and other staff members' time. And so these are just kind of coming up in order that they um, are able to be processed. Processed. So that's that's sort of how our timeline came to be and, and how we're moving through it. And ultimately, what we are trying to do with this rule language is to create a specific reasons exception uh, in our um, Oregon Administrative Rules Chapter 660, Division 4, and it's for uh, public roads constructed prior to January 1st, 1977. So again, we're really trying to stick with that original grandfathering provision and just carve out extra space for these other areas that weren't originally put in that definition of development. Um, and it is a local goal exception process, and I will talk more about what that actually means. So it's not an outright allowance for armoring, but it, but um, you know, an entity like ODOT or the the Public Works Department of Tillamook County will still have to go through a process with their local governments to gain approval for that. Um, our outcomes, what we really hope to get out of this rulemaking is specific guidance to our local governments for these special, specific facilities, um, and that these exceptions will become adopted into local comprehensive plans as they are put forth. And uh, like I said, it will result in more sh shoreline armoring, but hopefully in very discrete areas for transportation protection. So really acknowledging, you know, Highway 101 was developed in the 1940s. Other parts of our coastline similarly were developed well before 1977. Um, and they are very important lifeline routes and, and extremely important for the connectivity of our coastal communities with each other and then back to the valley. So um, uh, very important areas. And um, you know, shoreline armoring is one mitigation option, but it could be a really good one, uh, especially in the short term. And relocation and rerouting are potentially other things that ODOT and others are looking into, but um, they could be really infeasible in some areas, uh, considering the mountainous terrain of our landscape. So now I'm going to turn a little bit to goal two. So goal two is the land use planning goal, and that has um, a, a whole host of processes in it, but the exception process is one of them. And so a local government can take an exception to a goal when it finds that unique circumstances warrant a local override of the state goal to create a better outcome. And those requirements are outlined in goal two and also our Oregon Administrative Rule Chapter 660C Division 4. Um, and then there are usually specific uh, requirements outlined in every local government's comprehensive plan. Right now, there are other specific reasons already outlined for other types of goals and goal provisions that are outlined in this chapter of the goal of the rules. And so we would be adding another one to that list. So it's all together. Uh, I anticipate it will be a pretty straightforward um, language adoption. It won't be very long. It's just going to fit into this existing rule. So I know it feels like a lot to get to that point, um, but but there is a lot of history and effort that went to to get to this point. So I think it's important to acknowledge that and appreciate that. Um, but really, at the end of the day, I think we're talking about a pretty small change, um, like writing wise, uh, it will be a bigger change in actuality, but um, just want to kind of set your expectations for what we're going to be looking at. It's not going to be a huge rule um, development. Um, and really how this would work on the ground um, is that uh, local goal exceptions apply to specific properties or areas. Uh, they require notice to DLCD prior to any local public hearings. A final decision is made by the city or county governing body, and it's based on findings supported by substantial evidence. Um, again, those things are outlined already in our rule language for what, um, what else needs to be included in a goal exception. And then the final decision can be appealed to the Land Use Board of Appeals, which is LUBA. Um, so as an example, if we're talking about Highway 101, um, ODOT would have to apply 
to the local government in each section that is seeking structural erosion control protection. So for example, uh, this picture that you're looking at is in um, Lincoln County. It's uh, just north of Newport. And so if they wanted to use structural protection in this area, they would apply to Lincoln County and Lincoln County would go through the process to approve or deny a local go exception for uh, Highway 101. There was an attempt in 2002 to uh, amend goal 18 to add Highway 101 to the definition of development, but it ultimately failed and was withdrawn. Um, it was a joint effort by both the commission of ODOT and our commission, LCDC, um, to, to try to put that forward. Um, but in the last sort of last hearings that occurred, there was a lot of public opposition from multiple sides. There was opposition from those who did not want to see more armoring, period, uh, and just no more shoreline armoring for anything. And then there was also opposition from people who represented like local public works and other facilities like that who wanted other things to be included in that definition of development for shoreline protection outside of just Highway 101. So altogether, the, the two commissions ultimately decided to withdraw their proposal and um, the goal was not amended. So I, I just want to mention that because it was tried already and also the goal 18 focus group did talk about an, a goal amendment as another option to protect Highway 101 and other public roads, but it was ultimately decided to be infeasible and that things have not changed that much politically to make that amendment process go any easier. Uh, doing a goal amendment is quite a lengthy process. It does require 10 public hearings around the state um, and it does open up the entirety of the goal for amending, not just one particular area. So um, there can be some unintended consequences with that when you amend a goal. It's certainly not something that we have, you know, taken off the table completely, but at the end of the day, the focus group really recommended this compromised approach of doing a local goal exception and narrow it and, and make it specific to these assets that um, are at risk of erosion and to try to create a more streamlined process for them to get to ultimately get that protection. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of background of how we got to this policy approach in particular and where it came from. <clears throat> So what's our charge? What are we going to do? Um, so this was also in your RAC packet. Hopefully you've looked through it. This is coming from our Land Conservation Development Commission. They would like us to keep consistent with the principles of Goal 18 shoreline armoring provision and grandfathering clause, allow for protection of an important lifeline route on the coast through shoreline armoring when needed, support local government decision making through a clear goal exception process and rule language, develop clear and focused rule language tar targeted to public ocean fronting roads only, ensure the new rule does not have unintended adverse impacts on coastal communities or natural resources, and that in general, the rules must be clear, understandable, and enforceable. And in this case, they will only apply to local jurisdictions and public applicants. It's also important to talk about what we're not included in the rulemaking, which I think probably is clear to you all at this point, hopefully, but um, it's worth mentioning. That basically, we can't do anything outside of our purview. We can't change any rules or statutes that are not within the Land Conservation Development Commission's purview. So for example, we can't change anything to the ocean shore alteration standards that um, guide the approval or denial of the actual beachfront protective structures. Um, we can't make, we uh, are not going to change the interpretation of the definition of development and what is eligible or not eligible for shoreline armoring under this current um, requirement. And then we're not changing the core policy of prohibiting shoreline armoring for post-1977 development. To, uh, we recognize, you know, that there are a lot of things that coastal communities are going to need to do to adapt to coastal hazards and a changing climate. And this is just one small piece of that whole puzzle. So there may be other rulemakings or other uh, policy agendas that may need to be moved forward to address those other concerns. Um, but in this particular context, um, what we are doing is amending the reasons necessary to justify an exception under goal two um, to address these, these public ocean fronting roads. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, 
please let me know what you think. Uh, any questions, concerns, comments? Do you feel like you understand the role of, of you all and, and what we're setting out to do? Jeff says yes. Okay, that's good. <laughs> Laurel says yes. Charlie says yes. Great. <coughs> well, thank you for bearing with me as that was a lot of information to convey. Um, I know some of you have been involved in this for a long time, so it's no nothing new to you. But for some, I'm sure that is new information and. Uh, and it can be complicated and complex, but hopefully it makes some sense. <laughs> well, feel free to ask questions at any time uh, via email uh, throughout this process. Um, the last kind of slides that I have um, to wrap up the meeting today are just more about timeline and next steps and what we'll be doing next um, to prepare you for our next meeting. So with that, I'll just kind of, go over our timeline. Um, so as I mentioned, our rulemaking initiated in July, and that's when we had RAC recruitment. I want to thank you all for filling out our application. That's kind of a new thing that we're doing at DLCD, and it's been really helpful. So I appreciate the time it took to fill that application out. It was very, very helpful for us to make sure we had all the um, interests included in the RAC that we wanted to have. Um, now we're in the, the meeting schedule, which is December through March. Um, and this is where we'll be meeting and drafting the rule, the language, as well as compiling a fiscal impact statement, which is a requirement of rulemaking um, with the Secretary of State. The first public hearing with our commission will occur in May of 2022. Then we will have a geographic hearing in June of 2022. A geographic hearing is required for any rulemakings that apply to a specific geography and not statewide. So since this is only going to apply to the coast, we have to have a geographic hearing. And then um, the uh, final adoption, hopefully, uh, that is a, at least what we anticipate, will happen at our July 2022 LCDC meeting, and then the rule would become effective in August. Um, our next meeting will be a working meeting, and so I will bring a draft of the rule language to you all, and then we will work from that. Um, and uh, so I will try to have that to you a week in advance of our next meeting um, so that you have time to read it ahead of time and come up with um, your own thoughts and feedback around it. Um, but I'll at least have something for you to work from, and then um, we can talk about that and discuss you know, the nuances of all the language and um, ha unintended consequences or if it's inclusive or not inclusive or, you know, things like that. So that's what we'll be doing at our next meeting. Our third meeting, which will be in March, will be to finalize that, that rule language based on your feedback and then um, to do the fiscal impact statement. I think that will also be really easy and small for this rulemaking because um, we're not really uh, proposing anything new. It's going to be an existing process that local governments already do um, and the applicants already do. So the fiscal impact statement will likely be really small. Um, so with that, I'd like to schedule our next meeting. Uh, hopefully you saw in the RAC packet a couple of suggested dates. And so Mandy is going to do a poll. And so please choose all the dates that work for you. Um, I did hear from one of our members that um, the week of January 10th is not good, um, nor the week of March 21st. So if you can um, do the, the second week of January or the first week of March, that would be our preference to make sure everyone can attend. So um, Mandy, if you can put that up and then, um, and these are, yeah, the first one is dates in January, 
the second question is dates in March. So um, I think you can choose all that apply, all that all that you can make. So please only choose the dates that you are able to attend. And if anyone has any trouble with the poll, let us know. Is the spring break week for schools, is that the 21st through the 25th? Yes. Okay. That's what I figured. I should know that by now. <laughs> <laughs> I did not know it until someone pointed it out. <laughs> I was like, oh. There's also, um, you know, there's some session dates in there for the legislative session. So I'm trying to avoid those to some extent too, but. I know it's hard to avoid everything. Okay, anyone else still need to? in their dates yeah sorry meg I, I didn't put mine in yet oh, okay sorry yeah i'll give it a couple more minutes takes a little bit to match up your calendar to all these dates yeah it's kind of hard yeah if we if we need to i can do another doodle poll at yeah email too uh, i was trying to get it done today if we can but um yeah to at least get an idea would be good yeah. Looks like January 17th and 18th are looking good. Or no, sorry, that was March, March 17th and 18th. And Mandy or Casaria, is there anything that I haven't mentioned that I should have that you can think of? We will have the summary. I think you've mentioned that available two weeks from today for this meeting. Um, and then, I don't know, is there anything else, Casaria? I think she may have jumped off. Yeah, she might have. I think there's another rule advisory committee meeting happening this afternoon too. So a lot going on. Oh yeah, it looks like she did. But I mean, the summary shouldn't be too hard. I kept pretty close notes and then we have the closed captioning and recording. So there's more than enough coverage for um, all the information, I'm sure. Yes. Um, yes. Thank you, Mandy. So there's, as a reminder, that's where the that's the link to the rulemaking webpage for anyone um, who hasn't found it already, and my email address. Um, we, like I said, we're we update that with all the meeting information and resources, and then we send out um, meeting information through Gov Delivery, um, and we are going to take public comment um, through. Uh, written public comment uh, anytime to my email 
Um, I did want to mention that we did receive one public comment at this point, um, and that was included in your meeting packet. It was the last um, item, and it was a letter from Oregon Shores Conservation Coalition, and it was actually um, a broad letter about our agency's policy agenda in uh, overarching, um, but there was a section about this rulemaking in, in particular, and so I did want to make sure to provide that to all of you. Um, I think I highlighted on the, on the document where that part of the letter starts, so um, you can put your attention to that section only. Um, and so yeah, I just um, advise you all to read that if you haven't already, just to make sure that we know um, what the comments are um, in, in moving into the drafting of the rule language. Um, okay, well, I think that's oh, I think it. Close. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Anyone sorry. else need the poll still? I got a few chats too. Hopefully those get saved. Mandy, do you know? Okay. Um, I right, think, and, yeah, go ahead. You can go ahead and end it and we can see if there's any consensus. <laughs> there we go. I'm gonna share the results. There's the results. Um, so we can kind of get an idea. Yeah. So it looks like maybe January 25th yeah. for our next meeting and potentially uh, the 17th or 18th of March for the third meeting. Well, I'll, how about we tentatively say January 25th, um, but we'll follow up to see if that does not work for someone, please email me um, as soon as you can. And, uh, and then if we need to, we can um, do a, another a follow-up poll. Anyone have any questions, thoughts, concerns before we start uh, head out? Um, I'm glad it was a short meeting. Uh, the next one might be a little bit longer, but, um, and I'm sorry that it was so much of me talking, but hopefully it was helpful. <laughs> Thanks for doing this. Yes, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Meg, for leading this process. I thought you did a really nice job kind of uh, going through the issues and there's a lot there and it's, it's appreciated. Great, thank you. Thanks, Meg. Yeah, definitely appreciate all of you being here and your time and uh, hopefully we'll get to all discuss a lot more next time. So with that, um, yeah, pencil in January 25th, but we'll follow up with more and um, and we'll be in touch with um, the rack packet and draft materials and all that uh, moving into that first meeting or second meeting, I should say. Thanks, Meg. Are we blocking this in from two to four again? Yeah, actually, that, that's a good question before you all jump off. Is this time period okay for people? Do, do you have a preference? I, we can only do within the workday, so between nine and five typically. Um, but if there's a better time, I'm happy to change it. I think I marked that that date wouldn't work for me, but if it's two to four, I can make that work. Okay. I just have to okay. Then we can definitely do that. Um, does anyone not like this time, two to four? Okay. Well, that's that's good then. Meg, are we also holding the 17th or 18th for now, or? Um, you, you can, I'll, I'll follow up though. Um, but if you wanna put something on your calendar just uh, because you don't want it to fill up, um, please do so, same time, two to four. Um, but I'll uh, follow up. Okay, any other thoughts, questions? Great. Well, thank you all so much and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. We'll talk to you soon. Take care. Thanks, Bye. Meg. Yeah, Thanks. Thank you. Bye.